Hey, Adrian, it looks like you're just getting started. Now, when an auditor arrives on site for a furnace inspection and some diagnostic testing, how do you like to begin the process? Well, the very first thing I do is I always make sure I introduce myself to the homeowner. And I explain to them why I'm here, that I'm here to do a, either an energy audit on their furnace or a diagnostics testing series. I'll explain to them what I'm going to be doing. I'm told them that I'm going to be doing numerous amounts of testing. Uh, I'm going to be running the furnace. I'm going to be drilling some holes so I can test static pressures. I'll try to talk to the homeowner and get them to tell me how old the heating system is, how long since they've had their maintenance done the last time. Have they noticed anything different about the heating system? That probably helps out with the comfort level between the auditor and the homeowner. Very much so. You know, when you, you establish that communication with them, that few minutes is really important because all of a sudden they're comfortable with you in the home. You know, they know you're going to be in and out of their house a lot. They know that the furnace may be running for a short period of time, but it's going to quit right in the middle of the cycle. But they're prepared for it. And they're not worried that you've done damage to their unit. Okay, so regardless of the location of the furnace room, what are some of the things you're looking for when you walk around a house? When I do my first ninja walk around, I walk around, I check the supplies and returns. I want to make sure they're all open because one of my testing is a static pressure test. And I'm going to measure the pressure differences and the airflow of the furnace. So it needs to be open. If I come up on something like a piece of uh, furniture that's over a return air, I'll discuss with the homeowner, can I possibly have it moved? Or I'll document the reason why it is. I'll open all the registers so I have constant airflow. Okay, so you're trying to get real-world testing or a real-world testing environment there. You're not trying to rearrange everything in the house, but you want to understand the parameters that you're dealing with? So, you know, because if some large pieces of furniture can restrict the airflow a little bit on the return, I ought to be able to document that so I know why my testing might be a little bit different than it should. So now I'll document the thermostat settings so that I can come up and return the home to the condition that I found it. Okay, so good communication is the key. What do you say we head on downstairs and get into the test? Sounds good. After meeting with a homeowner, what I like to do is come down and take a look at the heating system first to get a visual inspection. And the things I'm going to be looking for before I even open a cabinet up or anything else is I'm going to be looking around the base of the unit to see if there's any moisture on the ground from condensate because this is a 90-plus condensating furnace. So if there's any concerns with condensation leaks, I'll be able to see them on the concrete. I'll also look and locate where the gas valve is, do a visual inspection of the gas line here. I'll check where the, locate where the power switch is on and off, check and see if it has the proper size fuse. Regardless of the type of furnace it is, you like to begin with a visual I inspection. I always begin with a visual inspection because another thing I'm looking for is I will look around the unit itself. I'll look at the condition of the paint on the sides of the walls because if I have a burn spot or a discoloration in the paint, that's a sign there may be potential cracked heat exchanger. The next thing I'll do is I'll take a look at the venting. And what I look there for is to see if it's got the proper pitch, if there's any leakage. You know, depending upon the PMI, which is per manufacturer's instruction of the unit, they'll tell me what the pitch should be. I'll check the filter. I'll look at the filter. Make sure the filter's clean. So I start with a clean filter when I do my testing. Then I'll open up the cabinet. And what I'll do here, I'll look for how these connections are made, if they're solid. There's no signs of rust on the connections. I'll look down here to the gas valve. I'll check the fan control, look at this visually to see if the cover is missing or whatever. So when I find something that's irregular, I will take a photo documentation of it and I'll document it in handwriting. So when I communicate with my contractor or my crews, I know that they've corrected the things that I've mentioned. Sure, it makes sense to me. So really what you're saying is when you come down here, before you start any diagnostic testing, take a good look at it. See if the furnace is talking to you. And I suspect the more audits you do, the more familiar you become with these telltale yes. signs. And then the next thing I'll do is I'll pop this open, and I'll look for the same thing. I'll look for rust and water on the bottom. Another thing I'll look for is soot in the condensate line. If I see soot in the condensate line, that's a sign of a plugged or a cracked secondary heat sink. I will go outside. When I do my gas check and everything else, I'll go outside and i look at the terminations. If I have soot in my terminations, that's another warning sign. That is, because you never should have soot on the gas frying. Sure. Okay, this is, like you mentioned, a 90% efficient mm -hmm. furnace. What about a natural drafting one, like a 70 or an 80%? When you look at a natural draft appliance, the things you want to look for is you want to look into the burners. You want to inspect the pilot, or it depends upon the ignition system. You want to look at that. If you notice a large amount of rust and corrosion in the bottom of the burner chamber, that's a sign that this heat exchanger is starting to flake. Another thing you want to look for is you look at the tops of the burners. If they're long ribbon burners or any type of burner, they, if they have rust or corrosion on the top of them, that means that that heat exchanger is having problems and the unit needs to be cleaned thoroughly. Another thing I'll be looking at when I look at a natural draft 
furnace, which is the 70s and the 80s, I will look for what's called flame rollout. And what that is, is the flue gases aren't being removed fast enough that it's forcing the flame to roll back out. And what I look for there is I'll see either discoloration in the paint or I'll see a line of soot. So it's especially important for an auditor to inspect the venting on a natural draft furnace, whether it's 70 or 80 percent efficient. This is very critical because that's how the combustion gases leave the home. And if they come back into the home, there's always potential for health. One of the first tests we will start to perform is a gas leakage test. And what we use is a gas leak detector. And what we start with is we go to all the joints. Being that this is an LP gas furnace, I like to start at the bottom. I always measure at the bottom first because LP is heavier than natural gas. If it was natural gas, I'd go to the top first and work my way around slowly. And when you're saying from the top and bottom, not necessarily here, you're saying at each joint. At each joint, I'll start, always start at the bottom because it'll hang. And I'll come around like this, and then I'll come around like this. And I'll do this for each and every joint, all the way from the outside regular on an LP and away from the outside meter on a natural gas, all the way in, making sure that I have access to all elbows, joints, and couplers. And so all the way through, and if it gets in there, it might be some tight areas, but it's imperative that an auditor does the testing at each joint. Yeah, we have to make sure we check everything. If I do detect a leak here, my sensor goes off, what I will do is confirm it with liquid soap. And if I get bubbles here, which means I will then document its location, I'll either put a piece of tape on there or something so that the contractor knows where to look, and if I'm going to schedule a crew, I'll have them repair it. If not, I will go up and tell the homeowner that they have a, a gas leak, that they need to have someone repair it. Okay, that makes sense. Is it possible to state where you typically find more gas leaks than others? You want to look at valves. You want to check unions and where they have short, tight nipples or short, tight connectors because it's hard to get that torqued in there properly. But at the end of the day, make sure from an auditor standpoint that regardless if you start at the furnace or at the meter or the regulator, check every single Every connection. joint. You have to check every connection because you don't know what you're going to walk away from. Stu, one of the other tests that we perform on a natural gas system is we clock the meter. And this test will let us know what this furnace is producing for heat and BTUs. And what an auditor should do to perform this test is he needs to make sure that no other gas appliances are firing at this time. And he will fire up the furnace that he wants to test. He will go outside to the outside meter. Now on this meter there is a series of dials. The top row is usually nothing but how much bulk fuel has been used. And that's what they read when they charge you for your fuel. The smaller ones is how much is the full rate of the fuel is. So what he'll do is he'll take either the half or the one, and he'll clock that, the length of time it takes for one complete revolution. So let's just say as an example, it takes 25 seconds to burn one cubic foot of fuel. I'll go to a chart that I have, and I'll look at the top of that chart, it'll say one cubic foot. I'll follow it down until it's at 25 seconds. And that will give me another number. And I'll take that number and I'll times it by a thousand, and that will tell me what the BTU rate that this furnace is producing. After we perform this calculation, we come and we compare the BTU rating of the furnace as it burns to the name pit. If it's 10% above or 10% below, the auditor needs to recommend service. What I'm doing now is a visual inspection of the heat exchanger through the observation port of the 90 plus. What I'm waiting for is I'm also listening at the same time. I'm listening for the purge motor to come up. Now I'm going to be watching for the glow igniter to come on. When that glow igniter comes on, they'll light the fuel, and that will give me some more light to be able to see inside. What I'm waiting for now is the glow igniter to come up. I see it starting to come up now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look inside the burner 
using the flashlight to see the condition of it, like this through the observation port, then I'm going to be looking down into the burner to see how each of the burners are burning. Okay? And what I'm waiting for now is the air handler to come on. When the air handler comes on, I want to be watching the flame to see if it changes shape or color. And if it does change shape or color, that means I need to do further investigation. And of course, that's where the documentation comes into play. Make sure yep. you document what you see, whether it's working correctly or well, incorrectly. Always right. document. Always. No. If this was a 70 or an 80, we have, since we have more access to the burner compartment or the clamps, I would be doing a visual inspection with a borescope, or I'd be doing a visual inspection with a mirror. And if I suspected something from there, I'd probably open up a small hole in the back and use the borescope to go inside and take a better look at the heat exchangers. Because they're older, and it's more likely to have a cracked heat exchanger, given the shape, the type of heat exchangers they are, the age of the metal. And then we would be looking for stress points, where we see discoloration in the metal, where metal had been bent to make something fit. But since this is a 90%, it's a little bit different. Yep, it's a little bit different. If I don't see many growth changes when I start doing my other testing, I should be able to tell if there's a potential for a crack or not. Here comes the air handler now. I want to make sure I'm observing what's going on in the flames. Now, what I want looking for is called ghosting. That's the flame changes shape as if there's a crack or some problem inside the heat exchanger that makes that flame change shape or color. Okay. What I see here now is if the flame is solid, straightforward out, has good color, and when the air handler came on, it didn't waver or ghost, which means that it does something like this, so that I know there's not a big enough hole that the air handler can affect the heat exchanger. And so documentation plays a huge role, whether you find something that you suspect to be wrong or not. Yep. You want to document. I'll put down, when I do my report, there is no flame waver or ghosting, and I don't suspect a potential for a fact heat exchanger. If I do suspect something, then I will have someone go deeper into the system. So the key thing to remember, there are some differences between the 90, the 80, and, and the, the 70, 70, mainly access to the burning chamber. Yeah, the initial inspection on the 70s and 80s, because they're open combustion, I can get more equipment inside to see better. Here, everything is so compact and so tight that you have to completely disassemble it a lot to actually get into the burner chambers to be able to see. So we use the visual, the key, if there's another concern. Now, Adrian, before we get too far along in our diagnostic testings, let's step back and explain the steps in the operation of a furnace, really how it operates. All the heating systems, a 90, an 80, and a 70, all have basic steps. Newer the furnace is, the more complicated. So we're going to start with a 70. What happens is the thermostat calls for heat. The second thing is a gas valve opens up, allows fuel to flow into the burners. The burners come on. Some control in some way or form, after it's reached temperature, turns the air handler on, the air handler runs until the house equalizes in temperature. Once the thermostat says it's done, it shuts the burner down, and whatever control is controlling that fan lets it run for either a timed event or for a mechanical switch. That's the basic principle behind a 70, which is the base of everything else. Now, when we step up to an 80, you know, it does the same thing. Thermostat calls for heat. Now, usually it has a different type of igniter. It's not a pilot, a standing pilot. So, inducer motor spins, and that's on a centrifugal clutch. It spins up. And it tells the igniter to spark ignite or glow or whatever system it is. The igniter proves itself because there's a flame sensor. And then once that clutch gets up to a certain speed, then it tells the gas valve to open up. The gas valve opens up, allows fuel. The flow produces the heat. The heat produced. The mechanical switch turns on the air handler. The air handler runs. The thermostat equalizes. The burner shuts down. The air handler removes the rest of the heat. Now, with a 90 plus, it's a little more complicated because it's not so much mechanical, it's all computerized, especially the more modern unit. The first thing that happens is that the thermostat calls for heat. Well, when that happens, there's a pre-perch that this motor here will spin up to make sure that it cleans all these exhaust gases or combustion gases out of here. Kind of cleans the system. You pre purges cleans it up so there's no potential for any problems. Well, that's usually about a minute. Well, then what happens is that spins up the pressure switch mates and it turns on the glow igniter or a hot surface igniter. That hot surface igniter reaches up to temperature. It's measured with ohmage. The ohmage comes up. And once that glow igniter proves itself, 
the gas valve opens up and allows fuel to throw through the burners. The thing about a 90 plus versus a, the 70s and the 80s, 90 plus are all usually computerized control fan times. So there's a certain time after that burner comes on that the air handler comes on. Once the house equalizes the temperature or that reaches the point that the homeowner has it set for, the thermostat tells the gas valve to shut down, then the computer kicks in and shuts the air handler down at a prearranged time. That's how you get so much more efficiency out of it. There's another test that we perform on some of the heating systems, and we use this digital manometer. It's called a draft test. And what we're measuring is the pressure or the lift of the natural flue gases leaving through the system. It has to be a certain rate of speed or pressure rating depending upon the outside temperature. And you're looking for the natural rise, so on a 90% efficient pressure, you wouldn't be test. doing it. No, only on 70s and 80s. Okay. And there's a little slight variance between a 70 and an 80. A 70 is pure natural draft which means that we take the reading just a little bit above where the furnace is and put a hole in there, go to the center of the pipe and measure the center core of the draft. If we're doing it with an 80 that has a draft assist, we have to go a little bit higher so we get above any positive pressure that that fan builds. So we want to be actually where the natural order of things take over, the natural draft. Okay. And to do that, we use a manometer. So what we'll do is we will fire the unit, let it reach steady state, which means that the unit is come up to temperature, the stack temperature is pretty much stable, and then we will take this probe and this manometer, and we will slide this probe into the center of the vent pipe, and we'll take a reading. We'll take that reading in pascals or inches of water column, depends upon how you set your machine, and we will go back to a chart. And on this chart, we have to locate the outside air temperature. We need to know what the inside temperature of the house is. And below that will be a number. And that's the draft that we have to have in this vent system at that outside air temperature to ensure that we always will have the proper draft that we need, no matter what the temperatures are. So it seems to me that documentation of all the different numbers and the readings that you're getting is very important. Yes. Documentation, especially in a draft test, is very important because we need to know what the outside temperature was, the inside temperature is, and how much draft you actually had in the unit. Because we have to compare that to that chart. Someone else needs to be able to look at your temperature, look at the chart, and confirm what you've done. Now on a 70%, since there is no draft inducer or, or way to assist the draft, we have to do something called a spillage test. The purpose of that is we want to ensure that when the unit fires that there is no back drafting or air coming back down through the flue, forcing the flue gases into the house. Sure. So what we'll do is we'll start the unit up. And on startup, we'll be watching it. We'll take this something called a smoke generator, and we'll move it along what's called a draft diverter. Keep in mind that some of the venting systems have dampers in them that are temperature controlled. So we will get a little bit of spillage at the beginning. But we want to note that. So what we'll do is take the smoke generator, and we'll slowly pass along the draft diverter. And we should have a little bit coming out. Within one minute, that should reverse. That should all be going inside of this draft diverter and all the flue, because that draft diverter is where all the flue gases from the clams, or the 70%, converge into one place and get lifted out. Keep in mind, Stu, the draft test is performed under your agency's protocol for worst case pressurization. What I'm just finishing up here is an airflow test. And what I'm trying to measure is a CFM of the air movement through the system to match it to what the BTU rating of this is. And the equipment that I use to do that is a manometer and a flow plate. Before I even get started, the first thing I need to do is select the location for where I'm going to put a hole that allows me to put my static pressure probe into the return air system. And I'll do that on an average of about two feet up from the turn of the return drop, the shoe, okay, in the location that we're showing here. So then what I will do is I will turn the air handler on and I will read normal static pressure. And I will measure that static pressure for a period of time so I get an average. 
Sure. This manometer averages hundreds of times a second and gives me a solid average. So you're establishing a baseline with the existing filter in place. Yep, a baseline with the existing filter before I change anything. Okay, makes sense. Okay. So then what I will do is switch this over to true flow static pressure. And that's because I'm preparing to slide in that full plate. Okay. So then what I'll do is take the old filter out, slide in this full plate, making sure that I got my diamonds facing into the incoming air. I have to select the size of the plate, you know, a few settings that I have to make on here. And then I will measure the CFM. I got to compare it to the BTU rating of the furnace. I'll go to a chart and it'll tell me how much air I need to have moved. It does not matter if it's a 70% or 80% furnace or a 90. It all depends upon the BTU rating of that furnace. And the testing process itself, it the doesn't matter? It's all the same? It's identical. The only thing that might change a little bit is how the system is built, where I may put a probe in. Now, so some manometers are different. Some of the older manometers, you have to do a correction factor. You have to go to a chart, find a correction factor, because it doesn't have it built in. This model has it built in, so I don't need to do the correction factors. Again, documentation will play a key role always in all these tests. And one thing that you mentioned is when you do put the flow plate in there, make sure you cover that up. In yes. this case, it looks like you used some tape. I had used some tape because the cover has been lost. Another test we perform when we test furnaces is a static pressure test. And what we're measuring is the resistance to airflow through the return and the supply system. And this is very important because if the static pressures are higher, it means that we have restrictions in the system. So how do you recommend an auditor begin this testing process? We need to drill two holes, one in the supply and one in the return. And there's a couple of small rules that go along with this. The return air side has to be between the filter and the air handler. We have to get it in there somewhere. On the supply side, if there's an A coil present or an air conditioning coil, it has to be between the furnace cabinet and the air conditioning coil. So this makes this a little bit more complicated sometimes. So first thing we do is we take a reading in the return air after the filter but before the air handler. Okay. So in this case, we put a hole in the front cabinet because we don't have enough room to go to the side. And where you're talking is right down here where the filter goes in. Yes. Sometimes there's metal ductwork there that you can drill into. In this case, there yep. wasn't, so you just went right Look to the cabinet. Go in all the way to the air hanger. And it's probably a good idea if you don't have access immediately beyond the filter, check with the homeowner and get explain the situation. And get permissions before you drill into the cabinet. Yes. Okay. And we'll take the static pressure reading or the supply side. We'll make sure when we put our probe in, it faces down into the airflow. And we'll take the two numbers and we'll add them together and get a total. Now, the total for this furnace is 162 pascals. There's 250 pascals to an inch of water column. This is rated for a half an inch of water column. So we only need 125 pascals. Since you're at 162, you're a little bit higher. higher. Yes. So what does that mean? So at this point, we're at a point where the auditor is going to have to start making some decisions and making some recommendations to the homeowner. So we may need that we need to add some more return to the system. I may want to recommend that they go to a less restricted filter if there is no allergies or anything else in the home that would help. Now, if we take this test, with my static pressures is a little bit high, and my flow rating for this furnace, which is just about right where it should be at 1,000 CFM for a 90,000 BTU furnace, all I need to do is correct my return air pressures a little bit, make the furnace work a little easier. Okay. But if I had a situation, and one of the biggest complaints we get from homeowners is the furnace is loud, it's, uh, the air is cool. We'll take the, the full test, sure. we'll take that reading, compare it to the BTU rating, take a temperaturized test and a static pressure test. We'll take all three of them, compare them together. But in the case where the static pressure is high, CFM is high, and my temperature rise is low, I can lower my CFM, lower my static pressure so it alleviates that concern, so the furnace works easier, and it'll bring the temperature rise up into the realm where it should be, so now the homeowner is getting warmer air at a slower rate with less noise. Sure, and it's a great case in point and why it's important for an auditor to understand the importance of each of these tests yep. as they relate to each other. And what an auditor needs to do, especially someone who's just starting in doing auditing, is take the numbers, take document them, because everything we do, we document very well. Take it to somebody who is a little more experienced and say, okay, this is what I have, now help me decide what I need to do.
good. Because after all, the auditor is providing recommendations. They're not doing the inflammation That's right. of the suggestion. The next test that we've performed is called the temperature rise test. And basically what we do with this testing is we take a reading of the temperature of the return air, as the air in the house coming back to the furnace, and we measure the temperature of the supply air leaving the furnace. There's a potential, if it's too high, that you can damage the heat exchanger because of, of stressing it. But it also lets me know the air temperature is going out into the home. To do this, I need to drill a series of holes. I need to have a hole that is halfway up my return drop. I need as many holes up to four all the way around on a plane around the panel. At the same level, we try to opt. If you can only get three on this plane, that's fine. If you can only get two on this plane, that's fine. We just need to be able to have an average. Sure, and the more the better if you have room to get in there. Yep. A lot of these, is like this one, looks like you could only get about three in there because it's such tight quarters. That's right. And do you want to get up as high as possible? I want to get up as high as I can on the plenum. If there's something that stops me from going any higher, that's the plane I'll pick to go all the way around. The reason we want three or four, preferably four, is it allows us to get the temperatures in the four corners. And that'll tell me if one side is higher by like 10 or so degrees, there's a potential that that heat exchanger needs to be worked on. So it helps me make a decision what I'm going to have someone do. Okay, a couple quick questions. So is it possible to use the same hole that you yes. drilled previously? Since I've done a prior test of my return air for my flow readings, I can use that hole for my return temperature. But I can't use my static pressure test here because it's too close to the heat exchanger. Sure. And, of course, you want to have three, four, as many as possible. Uh, are there special tools that you need? I prefer the old-fashioned method. I use meat thermometers that I can calibrate. And I'm always sure that they're calibrated. If you have the newer analyzers that have the capability of using a thermal probe or something on that order, that helps too because it does a lot of the figuring for you. Sure. Okay. But it's important to understand what you're trying to accomplish there, where to drill the holes, and understand you don't need the latest, greatest equipment. It can be done with a meat thermometer. That's right. So you fire the unit, let it reach steady state, well, now on this one, I got three holes as though I could get access to. I put them all at the same plan on my supply side, and I averaged them because I divided it by three, and I come up with an average of 124. That's on the supply side. So on the supply side. And I had a 78-degree return temperature. Okay. And then I subtracted. That gives me my temperature rise. And then the temperature rise for this unit is 46. Then I'll go to the nameplate. I will look at the nameplate, and the nameplate will give me a range that it has to fall within. And this one, I have to be between 55 and 85. So we're actually a little cooler than we should be. Mm -hmm. But now we had a high CFM, which was just a hair high for the system. Our static pressures was a little bit high. Remember on our return. So now I could lower my fan speed a little bit, but still stay within the parameters I need. My temperature rise will rise a little bit. The air handler speed will go down, so the static pressure will go down. So that starts to come into parameters. And the homeowner is going to be more comfortable because the air is getting as warm. And there's a good chance that it will be a quieter running system as well. Yes. Well, that's a great case in point. And from an auditor standpoint, understanding the role of all these tests, how you can actually offer pertinent solutions that can help the homeowner out and understand exactly how the system is operating. You take these tests, you can see the corrections that you can recommend in some of the units. This test is a steady state efficiency test. And what I'm measuring is the efficiency of the furnace at steady state, which means all the metals are warmed, the air handler is up and running, the maximum amount of heat being produced and spreading out through the house. So we measure efficiency, we measure CO, and we measure stack temperature. All at the same time, we're performing three tests. With this piece of equipment, I can do that. And that piece of equipment, are there different variations of it, or do you definitely need something? No, like there's that? many variations of it. It just happens that this is the one that allows me to do all three. Okay. This is obviously a 90% efficient yep. furnace. Is it, does the testing vary between a 90, a 70, or an 80? The principles are exactly the same, between a 70, an 80, and a 90. 
The basis of this test is, is we actually measure the exhaust gases. So all our testing is done in the exhaust venting and in the flue gases. That's what we're measuring. We use the stack temperature of the flue gases. We use the oxygen content of the flue gases. And we use the carbon monoxide in the flue gases in our readings. It doesn't matter if it's a 70. It doesn't matter if it's an 80. It doesn't matter if it's a 90. All these three numbers are the ones that we want to document and monitor. So let's start with a 70% efficient furnace. Its test is slightly different than all the others because we want to measure each flam individually or each burner we measure individually, which means we'll take the probe and we will get it right into each clam at the top and measure that. So as soon as we reach steady state in this clam, which means the stack temperature is leveled out, it goes up one degree, down one degree, but it's all right around that point. Record that and switch to the next clam. Take that measurement, all three of the measures are recorded. I'll switch to the next clam, take all three of the measures and record it. Regardless how many clams there are, that's how many times we have to do that. And we record CO, we record efficiency, we record oxygen and temperature. And I will take it and compare it to the PMI for this furnace. And the PMI is the per manufacturer's instructions. Okay. So let me take you through the 80. There's a slight variance in difference with an 80. 80 doesn't have a draft diverter. So I don't have access to the clams. Okay, but it's still natural draft appliance or open combustion. Mm -hmm. So what I will do is I'll select a point up in the venting. If it's got a draft inducer, I'll go a little higher. Hopefully I've already drilled a hole because I've done a previous test for draft or something like that. And that's where I'll do my test. I'll insert my probe in there, let the unit reach steady state, and do my record. And that will allow me to measure the CO, the SSE, and stack temperature, everything all at one time. Okay, and then in the 90 right here? So this 90 here, one more step we have to add to it. When we're doing it with a 90, we have to have two holes, one in the intake and one in the exhaust. So we drill a hole in the intake and in the exhaust. We take our probe and we stick it into the intake. We turn the furnace on. When the purge motor comes up, it pulls air down through from the outside. So we measure the oxygen content of that. We measure the temperature of that at the same time as the unit cleans itself out and gets ready to do the test. By now, the exhaust hasn't fired yet. The burner hasn't run. It's just doing its cleanup purge. Sure. I will take my thermal couple and move it to the intake. So my constantly monitoring the difference in temperatures. So what I'll do now is I'll wait until it fires and I'll watch the oxygen content. I'm not worried about if it's got the steady state yet, but I'll wait till the air handler comes on and I'll be paying close attention because when that air handler comes on, I'll be watching the oxygen. Mm -hmm. If the oxygen jumps by one point or better, that's a general rule of one point. It means I have a potential for a crack or something in the system. If it stays the same, I don't have to worry about it. I know in past testing, we did a visual to look if there's any no. ghost in any fluttering. This really enhances that or is a substitute to that because this will tell you whether there's oxygen there that shouldn't be there. If you take this with the other things that we've seen today on this unit, I would feel confident saying there's not a crack here. Okay. So then what we'll do is we'll wait to the stack temperature equalizes, which means it stops climbing, but stay pretty constant. That I have reached steady state. I will read my CO, which in this case was three parts per million for this furnace. Then my steady state efficiency was 90.3 or 90.4, varied just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And my stack temperature was about 112. I'll document the CO, I'll document the stack temperature, I'll document the efficiency. And then what I will do is compare it to the PMI of this furnace. Now, when you're getting to this stage of the testing, does it matter between a 70, 80, 90% furnace? No, it does not matter. So whether it's a 70, an 80, or a 90, really what the auditor is doing is testing in the exhaust vent. You're getting all those different parameters. Once you have got all your numbers, then you can compare those to the PMI, the per manufacturer's instructions, and that will allow you to understand the running state of the furnace in order to make recommendations or to at least document that everything is good. And if we tie it together with all the other testing we've got, we can come up with a fairly good idea of some recommendations we may need to get to home.